Greetings and welcome to Carmelite Conversations. This is Francis Harry, your host. My co-host, Mark Danis, will be back with me next week. Mark and I were in the midst of a series on St. Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a Discalced Carmelite nun. And there are so many aspects of the spiritual life that we may expand upon through her example. So we've gone into greater depth with her, always trying to point out how what we are discussing pertains to our lives today, here and now. Our next program in the series on St. Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart will discuss her dark night. And for this, Mark and I agreed that we'd like to discuss that together. So that's why this week, when he's gone, I'm slipping in a program that is not part of the series. However, it is pertinent to our growth in holiness and prayer because it's on Our Lady, Our Lady Mother of Divine Grace. Now, why would I pick that topic and do it now? Well, it just so happens that tomorrow, July 23rd, is the memorial of Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace, in the Discalced Carmelite proper of the Liturgy of the Hours. It is particular to the Carmelite order, but it benefits us all. And so it is appropriate that we pause to consider this title of the Blessed Virgin Mary and how it pertains to us. First, though, I'd like to begin with an opening prayer, and this is taken from the Memorial Mass for Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace. So let us get recollected and know that we are entering into the presence of God in a special way as we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God of eternal wisdom, in your providence you willed that the Blessed Virgin Mary should bring forth the author of grace and take part with him in the mystery of man's redemption. May she obtain for us grace in abundance and bring us to the haven of everlasting salvation. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us begin by considering this question. Why do the Carmelites have a memorial to Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace, on July 23rd? I didn't know the answer to that for many years. <laughs> well, the easiest answer is to look at the calendar and count the days from the solemnity of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which was July 16th, to this date of July 23rd. And what do we get? Eight days. That's an octave. July 23rd is the feast that concludes the octave of the Solemnity of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Having an octave celebration in the church is very special, as you know. We have the octave of Christmas and the octave of Easter. The octave of a feast refers to the eight-day festal period commencing with that feast. So the connotation for me is that Our Lady of Mount Carmel culminates in the celebration of Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace. And without grace, where would humanity be? And what a beautiful connection we have with the beginning of this octave honoring Our Lady of Mount Carmel, who, according to legend and tradition, and blessed by the Church, in a vision she gave to the Carmelite, St. Simon Stock, the brown scapular, telling him, Receive, beloved son, this scapular of thy order as a badge of my confraternity, and for thee and for all the Carmelites a special sign of grace. Whoever dies in this garment shall not suffer everlasting fire. It is a sign of salvation, a safeguard in dangers, a pledge of peace and of the covenant. Well, that's really strong, isn't it? I hope you have your brown scapular on there. Well, in the catechesis and ritual of the brown scapular of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, this promise echoes the promise of divine revelation. 
In Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, the one who holds out to the end is the one who will see salvation. And from Revelations chapter 2, verse 10, remain faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. The brown scapular is a reminder to its wearers of the saving grace which Christ gained upon the cross for all and which Mary has given to us to help dispense graces to all of her children. So the brown scapular helps dispose the soul to receive grace, and so we in the octave with Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace, receiving more grace. And just as an aside, a blogger by the name of A Solitary Bird wrote how St. Teresa of Avila, after the death of her mother, when she was only 12 years old, was sent to the convent school run by Augustinian nuns. And you know what the name of the school was? It was Our Lady of Grace. Here it was that St. Teresa of Avila was greatly influenced by the nuns and began to return to the good habits of her early childhood. We find that in the book of her life, chapter 2, verse 8. How appropriate for St. Teresa to be placed in the care of Our Lady of Grace under this title when she no longer had an earthly mother of her own. And now she would receive the tender loving care and spiritual embraces of Our Lady of Grace. And St. Teresa of Avila, of course, has let the graces that she received permeate our lives through her writings like The Interior Castle and The Way of Perfection. You know, the motherhood of Mary is important to all the faithful. She helps to restore supernatural life into our souls, just like she did with St. Teresa of Avila. The Catechism of the Catholic Church explains the Blessed Mother's role in our lives in paragraph number 968, which says, In a holy, singular way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the Savior's work of restoring supernatural life to souls. For this reason, she is a mother to us in the order of grace. This motherhood of Mary in the order of grace continues uninterruptedly from the consent which she loyally gave at the Annunciation and which she sustained without wavering beneath the cross until the eternal fulfillment of all the elect. Taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Another connection for the Carmelite family to the title of our Mother of Divine Grace is a beautiful image of Our Lady particularly venerated on July 23rd, this feast of our Mother of Divine Grace, and it carries with it a wonderful promise. This oil painting is called Mater Grazia, or Mother of Grace, but it's also known as Our Lady of the Bowed Head. It was rescued from a pile of abandoned ruins and lovingly restored in 1610 by Venerable Dominic of Jesus and Mary of the Discaus Carmelite Order. According to his testimony, Our Lady spoke to him, and she promised him, All those who implore her protection, devoutly honoring this picture, will obtain their petitions and will receive many graces. Moreover, I shall hearken in a special manner to the prayers that shall be addressed to me for the relief of the souls in purgatory. You can find more about that story in a book called Miraculous Images of Our Lady by Joan Carol Cruz. Most importantly, we honor Mary as Mother of Divine Grace since she is the Mother of the Son of God, the author of grace. It means that Except for Mary, we would not have Christ, who is the author of our supernatural life. In other words, the source of all grace, without which none of us could hope for heaven. 
It means that Mary, who mothered the author of grace, not only physically in conceiving him and giving him birth, but spiritually in caring for him during his mortal stay on earth, and mystically after his ascension when she cared for his infant church. God has chosen her to be the treasurer who dispenses all of his graces. And since Mary has formed through her physical maternity the head of the church, Jesus Christ, she also spiritually forms those who make up the body of Christ, the true Christians. God has given to her the vocation to nourish souls and make them grow in him. St. Augustine says that the predestined in the world are enclosed in the womb of Mary and come to the light only when their good mother brings them forth to eternal life. It is to her that the Holy Spirit said, Take root in my elect. That's from Ecclesiasticus, chapter 24, verse 12. Creating roots of deep humility, of fervent, burning charity, and of all the virtues. And as it says in Hebrews 4, verse 16, So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the Carmelite proper of the Liturgy of the Hours, we see this explanation of this memorial. It says, and this is actually from Lumen Gentium, which is light of the nations. The Blessed Virgin Mary was eternally predestined in the context of the incarnation of the Divine Word to be Mother of God. As decreed by Divine Providence, she served on earth as the loving mother of the divine redeemer, his associate, uniquely generous, and the Lord's humble servant. She conceived, bore, and nourished Christ, presented him to the Father in the temple, and was united with him in his suffering as he died on the cross. In a completely unparalleled way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity with our Savior's work of restoring supernatural life to souls. For this reason, she is mother to us all in the order of grace. Now I'm going to be pulling from my notes on an article called Feast of Mary. It's by Father Lawrence Lavazic. I found it on EWTN. And um, I'm going to just be pulling a couple points from that article that... Uh, from the particular day of, of Mary, uh, Mother of Divine Grace. Mary had and still does have a unique role to play in the whole work of redemption that Jesus obtained for us by being the perfect atonement for our sins. Throughout his life, Jesus wanted Mary to be associated with him. Mary perfectly cooperated in his work by the entire union of her will to his. Jesus willed, one, that Mary be present at each stage of his mortal career, renewing, continuing, completing what she had done at the Incarnation. Number two, he also willed that the offering of himself should be presented to the Father through her hands. When Jesus was born, Mary offers him to God the Father at the temple to Simeon and Anna. And again, it is Mary standing at the foot of the cross, offering Jesus to the Father in the crucifixion. Number three, Jesus willed to give himself to us through Mary. You know, we often hear in Catholic circles the phrase, to Jesus through Mary. Well, that's generally attributed to St. Louis de Montfort from his book, True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Jesus made his taking of the role of mediator dependent on Mary's consent, her fiat, which is Mary saying to God, thy will be done. It was her motherly care of Jesus throughout his life which made him ready for the sacrifice that reconciled the world to God. So when Christ was being crucified, he gives Mary to the Apostle John and to all of us as mother. The fourth point, since Mary is the mother of Jesus Christ, 
She's also the mother of divine grace as well. And Mary, as mother of God, is also seen as the mediatrix of graces. By this, one may come to the understanding in another way that under Mary's mediation and intercession depends the distribution of the riches of the treasury which Jesus acquired for the salvation of men. Consequently, no grace comes to all of us as a body or to any of us in particular, which Mary has not asked for in our behalf, perfectly loving mother that she is, who wants to take care of all of her children. <laughs> and according to the order of things established by God, Mary became under Jesus Christ, after Jesus Christ, and through Jesus Christ, from whom she may never be separated, the source and principle for us of all supernatural life. Jesus, of course, merited a treasure of grace for us by the life and death he offered up to the Heavenly Father. We cannot secure our salvation without these graces, for it is the grace of God which gives us light and strength to do good. Through the sacraments, the practice of virtues and prayers, we can participate in the life of Jesus. The Blessed Virgin Mary took part in this offering of the life and death of Jesus in an imminent and unique way because she prepared in her virginal womb a fit temple for the union of the Son of God, the Divine Word, with our human nature. Mary also took part in this offering by the consent, the fiat, which she gave to the whole plan of redemption and also by her union of will with that of Jesus, even to the point of his sacrifice on the cross. So I'm just sharing those points in a, two different ways of looking at them for, for our benefit. So if Mary had a part in the work of redemption, then we may easily conclude she had a part in all those graces which were prepared for us in the merits of Jesus and all for our salvation. Mary truly deserves to be called the Mediatrix of Grace. But let us go back and remember, what does the word grace mean? From the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 1996, it's a section on grace, we read, Our justification comes from the grace of God. Grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call, to become children of God, adoptive sons, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. The Baltimore Catechism defines grace as a supernatural gift of God bestowed on us through the merits of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Grace makes our souls holy and pleasing to God. When we say supernatural, we mean above or greater than nature. All gifts, such as health, learning, or the comforts of life, things that affect our happiness, chiefly in this world, those are called natural gifts. And all gifts, such as blessings, that affect our happiness, chiefly in the next world, are called supernatural or spiritual gifts. In the Catechism number 1997, it states, Grace is a participation in the life of God. Don't we all want that? We all want to be in God, of God, with God, for God. Grace is a participation in the life of God. It introduces us into the intimacy of Trinitarian life. By baptism, the Christian participates in the grace of Christ the head of his body. As an adopted son, the soul can henceforth call God Father in union with the only Son. He receives the life of the Spirit who breathes charity into him and who forms the church. Now let us recall there are two types of grace, sanctifying grace and actual grace. You'll remember that sanctifying grace 
is that grace which makes the soul holy and pleasing to God and is an habitual gift, a stable and supernatural disposition that is infused into the soul and perfects the soul itself to enable it to live with God, to participate in God's nature, to act by his love, making us similar to him. Sanctifying grace remains with the soul as long as, it is, as it's not guilty of mortal or deadly sin. And it is called habitual grace also. So one might ask, well, how do we get more grace? We know that we cannot merit grace nor produce it for ourselves, but we may, however, prepare ourselves and be disposed for it by fertilizing the soil of our soul. We try to remove obstacles, actions, and thoughts that block grace, and we try to be open to God's graces by trying to be pleasing in His sight, listening to His voice, and doing His will. In Psalm 94, verse 8, if today you hear his voice, harden not your heart, which is great guidance for us. You know, there are three supernatural means which dispose a soul to grow in grace. One is to receive the sacraments. Two is to practice the infused virtues, especially the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And thirdly, to pray, which we can all do 24-7. Father Cliff or Mattinger, in a book called If You Knew the Gift of God, the classical church teaching on grace, which I think is very good, he wrote, quote, Sacraments produce grace in the soul or increase it by their own intrinsic power. The practice of virtues develops grace in our souls by the way of supernatural merit. Prayer increases grace through its own impenetration before the mercy and goodness of God. Okay, I think we're going to take a break there, and when we come back, I'll pick up on a few other kinds of graces, and then we are going to apply that to the life of the Blessed Mother and to us. So we're going to take a break now, and we'll be back to discuss further our Mother of Divine Grace. We'll be right back. Hi, welcome back. This is Frances, and we're talking about Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace, here on Carmelite Conversations. Her feast day is tomorrow, July the 23rd. And so we were in the midst of talking about what graces are and how to grow in grace. Well, the sacraments, the virtues, and prayer. But there is a thing called actual graces, and that refers to God's interventions. It comes to us when we need help in doing or avoiding an action. It is that help of God which enlightens our mind and moves our will to shun evil and to do good. From the Catechism number 2003, it says, Grace is first and foremost the gift of the Spirit who justifies and sanctifies us. But grace also includes the gifts that the Spirit grants us to associate us with his work, to enable us to collaborate in the salvation of others and in the growth of the body of the Christ, the church. Well, think of the Blessed Mother's most perfect collaboration here. She who is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. There are sacramental graces, gifts proper to the different sacraments, there are furthermore special graces called charisms, after the Greek term used by St. Paul, which means favor or gratuitous gift or benefits. Whatever their character, and sometimes it's extraordinary, um, such as the gift of miracles or tongues, charisms are oriented toward sanctifying grace and are intended for the common good of the church. They are at the service of charity, which builds up the church. There are also special graces of state, and this is in Catechism 2004. These graces of state accompany the exercise of the responsibilities of the Christian life and of the ministries within the church. 
For example, prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, um, welcoming. Just as an aside, if, if you want to read more in depth and learn how to preserve and grow in sanctifying grace, I have turned to a, an older classic called um, The Glories of Divine Grace, and it's by Father Matthias J. Sheban, The Glories of Divine Grace. It's very rich and detailed. And you know, we need grace to grow. We need grace to participate in the life of God. This is where we'll be most truly who we're meant to be, who we're made in the image and likeness of God. With all that in mind, it's easy to see why God would want Mary, the masterpiece of his creation and the mother of his son, to distribute his graces because she far surpassed all other creatures in holiness. And especially because who, more than Mary, loved, honored, and imitated Jesus. And since she was addressed by St. Gabriel as full of grace before even conceiving Jesus, just think how she became super plain on nobis, overflowing with grace once the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. Mary, as mother of God and mediatrix of all graces, entered the highest state of power and glory in heaven in order that she might help us on our difficult journey to heaven. And as with every good mother, and here Mary being the best mother, she has our best interest at heart and obtains for us by her prayers all the graces we need to reach salvation. We, however, need to cooperate with Mary. Jesus is the head, and Mary is the neck through which all the graces flow to the body of Christ. In one of the twelve encyclicals on the rosary by Pope Leo the Thirteenth, he says, According to the will of God, nothing is granted to us except through Mary. And as no one can go to the Father except through the Son, so generally no one can draw near to Christ except through Mary. And from The Three Ages of the Interior Life by Father Reginald Gary Lagrange, he tells us, The Church, in fact, turns to Mary to obtain graces of all kinds, both temporal and spiritual. Among these last, from the grace of conversion up to that of final perseverance, you know, before death, in death. To say nothing of those needed by virgins to preserve virginity, by apostles to exercise their apostolate, by martyrs to remain firm in the faith. In the litany of Loretto, where Mary is addressed as Mother of Divine Grace, which has been universally recited in the church for many centuries, Mary is for this reason called Health of the Sick, Refuge of Sinners, comforter of the afflicted, help of Christians, and queen of apostles, martyrs, confessors, and of virgins. Thus, all kinds of graces are distributed by her, even in a sense those of the sacraments, for she merited them for us in union with Christ on Calvary. In addition, she disposes us by her prayer to approach the sacraments and to receive them well. Now we turn to the life of Mary. In the scripture passage of Proverbs 8, verse 18 through 21, we may apply to our mother Mary because it's in her hands um, that all the riches of divine grace flow to distribute to whomever needs them. The scripture passage reads, With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than gold, Yes, than pure gold, and my revenue than choice silver. On the way of duty I walk along the paths of justice, granting wealth to those who love me and filling their treasuries. The saints and the doctors of the church teach that Mary was full of grace for her own perfection and sanctification, that she might be a worthy tabernacle for the Most High. But... By the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, 
she became filled to overflowing with grace for our sake for it was she who was to bring to us jesus the author and source of all grace saint bonaventure a doctor of the church speaking of the field in the gospel in which a treasure is hidden says our queen mary is this field in which jesus christ the treasure of god the father is hid along these lines saint bernard states that our lord has deposited the plenitude of every grace in mary that we may thus know that if we possess hope grace or anything salutary salutary sorry <laughs> salutary that is from her that it came knowing as we do how necessary grace and mercy are in order to live a christ-filled life what greater means have we of securing these essentials than by calling upon the mother of divine grace the mother of mercy even before mary became the mother of jesus who is the source and fountain of all grace let's not forget that the archangel gabriel greeted her with the angelic salutation hail full of grace the lord is with you that's from luke 1 28. you know this greeting had nothing commonplace about it but it was exceptional and it had a solemn character about it i think we often forget this this word hail was used only for noble or royal persons like the emperor or a king in the only other place where this word is used it's addressed to jesus when he is called king such as in matthew twenty seven twenty nine or mark fifteen eighteen or john nineteen verse three just imagine it'd be like someone coming up to the average person and addressing you as your majesty the fact that the archangel gabriel addresses mary in this language reveals that she is a very important and special person unique person indeed we can get a better understanding of this by contrasting the two annunciations that begin the first chapter of the gospel of luke the announcement of zachary father of john the baptist in luke 1 4 through 27 contrasted with the announcement to mary in luke 1 28 through 38 the announcement to zachary you know who was exercising his highest priestly function contains nothing in the nature of a greeting with mary however there is a royal greeting so the angel greets her hail full of grace in the prayer we pray her name mary was only added to distinguish who the angel was addressing but saint gabriel does mention her name mary when he says later be not afraid mary for you have found favor with god in greek the words full of grace make up one word he carried homine which meant overflowing with grace scholars of greek grammatical and linguistic grounds paraphrase it as completely perfectly enduringly endowed with grace in latin it would be plena gratia or full of grace when god uses a word in place of a person's name or renames an individual it bears deep significance upon the very being and mission of the individual think of perhaps abraham which was exalted father and was renamed abraham father of many nations or jacob who wrestled with an angel and was given the name israel which meant contended with god and we have simon the fisherman who became peter the rock so saint gabriel by saying hail full of grace addresses mary as though her very name is full of grace additionally the compound word charis is at the center of the greek word kikaritomene and can mean grace favor loving kindness goodwill thanks reward and loveliness so we might think this was dealing with the favor of mary being chosen as the mother of the son of god yet there is more the prefix k from kikaritomene indicates a past action that has been completed and the effect of which continues into the present denoting someone who has been 
still is, and forever will be the object of divine benevolence. Thus for Mary to be Kekeritomene is for her to have been perfected in God's grace and favor in the past and for that effect to remain forever. So when the Archangel Gabriel greets Mary, not with her name, but hail full of grace, Kekeritomene, it's a reflection of her immaculate conception, the present moment of the Annunciation, as well as her future mission of treasure of God's grace and favor for us. Well, isn't that something to ponder? That alone should change the way we pray the Hail Mary. Additionally, since St. Gabriel's words were at the request of God, those words were from God. How honored are we to repeat them? So when we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, let us think of the potency and majesty of this greeting. The Catechism in 2676 says, It is God himself who through his angel as intermediary greets Mary. Our prayer dares take up this greeting to Mary with the regard God had for the lowliness of his humble servant and to exalt in the joy he finds in her. I'd like to make two more points about this, and they come from the angelic doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas. I pulled this from an article called, What Do We Mean by Full of Grace? It was written by Stephen Beale. The first point is that St. Thomas Aquinas notes in his commentary on the Hail Mary, the angel's reverent salutation of Mary is a complete reversal of roles from the Old Testament in which men revered angels. Such reverence, of course, was due to angels because angels have a spiritual and incorruptible nature and are more familiar with God and partake most fully of the divine light. In revering Mary, then, the archangel Gabriel is showing that she surpasses the angels in these three aspects. Only someone full of grace could merit such extraordinary reverence. Second, in the Greek text, as St. Aquinas points out, Mary's name is missing from verse 28 of chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel, like I said earlier. The text literally reads, Hail, full of grace. Mary has become so full of grace that it has consumed her completely. It has become more who she is even than her very name. So let us remember, in order to gain grace, we must pray. And let us remember to pray to Mary, Mother of Divine Grace. After all, as the, Cister the Cistercian abbot Andre Luf said, when we pray, we are constantly working with grace, or rather, grace is working in us. To pray is to learn to tune in to grace. Of course, our Lord is always the giver of graces, but it is his will to give graces to us through Mary. Eternal glory is but grace transfigured. That which is sanctifying grace in this life is in the next eternal glory. To be enriched by grace, we have but to love and pray to Mary, who always leads us to Jesus. And before I issue you a spiritual challenge, I just want to read this little excerpt that comes from St. Louis de Montfort. It's an excerpt from The Secret of Mary. And I think um, Carmelites will really appreciate this because he talks about um, the garden and the waters. So I'd like to share this quote. And I think it will put this uh, in perspective for Our Lady our mother, divine grace. He says, Mary is God's garden of paradise, his own unspeakable world into which his son entered to do wonderful things, to tend it and to take his delight in it. He created a world for the wayfarer. That is the one we are living in. He created a second world, paradise for the blessed. He created a third for himself, which he named Mary. 
She's a world unknown to most mortals here on earth. Even the angels and saints in heaven find her incomprehensible and are lost in admiration of a God who is so exalted and so far above them, so distant from them, and so enclosed in Mary, his chosen world, that they exclaim, Holy, 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 unceasingly. Happy, indeed, sublimely happy, is the person to whom the Holy Spirit reveals the secret of Mary thus imparting to him true knowledge of her. Happy the person to whom the Holy Spirit opens this enclosed garden for him to enter and to whom the Holy Spirit gives access to this sealed fountain where he can draw water and drink deep draughts of the living waters of grace. End of quote. I think with between the octave of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and the ending of the octave on Our Mother of Divine Grace, you know we have the Feast of St. Elijah, the prophet, and we talk about his fountain and the book Kareth and, and so these living waters and the grace, it just, it just keeps multiplying in this garden of Mount Carmel. So I just thought I'd share all that with you. So I'm going to issue you a spiritual challenge, and then we'll go to a closing prayer. The spiritual challenge is this, and this is what I'm challenging you, listener. Our Mother Divine Grace longs to help us to prepare our souls for Jesus, and most especially when we receive him in the Eucharist, in Holy Communion. Ask her to adorn your soul for Jesus. I know St. Therese, the little flower, did this. Put all your communions under the protection of Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace. Additionally, as you pray the Hail Mary, full of grace, prayer, Ponder the greatness of this greeting and know that you are participating in the very sentiments of God himself. That's a lot to ponder, isn't it? Well, I have a long closing prayer. Um, it's very appropriate for this topic, though, on Mother of Divine Grace. It's taken from a meditation from a book called Our Lady's Titles, and it's by Father Lawrence Lavasic. And these are meditations that are used for the titles of Mary that are found in the litan litany of Loretto. And Mother of Divine Grace is the particular day that I'm turning to. So we're going to go to this rather lengthy prayer, but stay with me and... Um, let us rejoice in the gift of Mary. This prayer is directed to Mary and finishes uh, being directed to God. So let's get recollected and understand that we are entering into the presence of God. Put your focus on the Lord present within you and outside of you. You are in him and he in you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Mary, you are the mother of divine grace because God bestowed upon you the fullness of his graces even before your birth. Having destined you to be the mother of his son, he adorned you with privileges corresponding to that dignity. If John the Baptist was sanctified before his birth, how much more were you to be sanctified and filled with graces before your birth since you were destined to be not only the forerunner of Jesus, but his mother. Because of your intimate union with Jesus as his mother, and because of his tender love for you, the measure of grace which God gave you in the first instant of your life was greater than that which he imparted to the angels and saints, who were only his servants. In order to merit this fullness of grace for you, Jesus shed his precious blood. Mary, you continually increased in grace as long as you were on earth. 
you did so in a far greater measure than all the saints of God, not defiled by original sin, and hence free of evil inclinations, you had no obstacle to overcome in the way of sanctity. There was no self-love or love of the world in your immaculate heart. You gave all your love to God and dedicated yourself entirely to Him. This love urged you to do whatever you knew was pleasing to God. Since every good work is rewarded by an increase of grace, who can tell how great was the number of graces which you acquired in your lifetime? Mother of divine grace, help me to treasure sanctifying grace more than all the goods of the world, because it enables me to possess God himself by divine love. It makes me his child and an heir to his kingdom. Let me rather die than lose this grace by a willful mortal sin. If this should ever happen to me, help me to recover at once by sincere contrition and penitence the grace I have lost. And since every good work is meritorious in the sight of God and increases sanctifying grace, if done for the love of God, aid me in being zealous and doing good. Mary, you have conceived and brought forth Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You alone obtained the grace which was given to no other creature, namely, to be filled with God himself, the author of grace. Every saint has received graces to help save a certain number of souls, but you have received such a fullness of grace that as mediatrix of all graces, you were to cooperate in the salvation of the whole world. Mother of divine grace, I have great confidence in you because God has made you the mediatrix of all graces and mother of grace for the benefit of your children. Do not re refuse my request when I ask you to help me to grow in the love of God to such an extent that I may reach that degree of holiness which God has destined for me. O oh God, you gave the human race the grace of forgiveness through the virginal motherhood of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Grant that we who call her the Mother of Grace on earth may enjoy her happy presence forever in heaven. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I want to thank you for joining me on Carmelite Conversations. And I pray that you receive immense graces tomorrow and always from Our Lady, Mother of Divine Grace. I hope that this conversation has inspired you or helped you in some way. Next week, Mark will be back and we will pick back up on this series on St. Teresa Margaret Reddy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And we're going to discuss in depth her Night of the Spirit, also referred to the Dark Night. To learn more about Carmelite Conversations, you can see our Facebook page, Carmelite Conversations, or go to our website, www.carmeliteconversations.com. And that's where our podcasts are archived. And there is an email address if you want to write to us. You can see it there. So again, I thank you for joining me in this conversation. And I hope that you will join us again. Meanwhile, may God bless you abundantly. Good night.